We're good? Yeah, we're live. All right. Sooner or later, some people will show up and then we can start doing this. All right, I'm gonna change my foot. Good morning. So everything we're doing is different today. Right, good morning. I didn't uh, finish changing my machine over, so I'm gonna work on that real quick while we wait for some folks to to show up. They're here. All right, <laughs> good, good. Good morning. All right, trying to get things arranged. So we're working on uh, embrace today, our double gauze. And uh, so I am rearranging the machine. We'll talk about it a little bit later, but I have to work. Um, it works a little bit differently. So all of my setup for cuddle, I have to switch it around. Mm -hmm. Do it differently for the embrace. All right. So hello, hello. All right. How many people we got there, Hawk? Thirty. All right. Okay, I'm getting there, guys. I promise. Um, so good morning. Welcome to Sew Together Tuesday. Teresa doesn't have a machine set up yet. Um, so I'm Teresa Coates. I'm the National Educator for Shannon Fabrics and today we are doing something a little bit different. So, so far in all of these Sew Together Tuesdays, if you've been joining us um, and if this is your first, welcome. I'm really happy that you found us and that you're here. Um, but so far we've been doing things that were with Cuddle or with Lux Cuddle Fabrics. And so that's primarily what we're known for as Shannon Fabrics is um, our Cuddle Fabrics. So today we're doing something a little bit different and we're gonna work with one of our other substrates. So we actually make a variety of different substrates. The Cuddle and the Lux Cuddle are the ones that are the most well known. Um, but we also make the Embrace Double Gauze, we make a terry cloth, we make silky satin. Um, and so we have these other substrates. Basically I tell people like we specialize in the weird fabrics um, because they're always a little bit different, not the stuff that you would find from the other manufacturers. So today we're gonna work on our Embrace Double Gauze, which is, um, a really great fabric and just totally different. So everything that we've done with Cuddle, we basically do differently with the Embrace. So it makes it kind of, um, I don't know, it's a fun its a fun diversion from the Cuddle and we'll use it in a completely different way as well, okay? Um, so welcome, okay? So Together Tuesday, I'm really happy you're here. Please leave a comment, tag your friends, tag your sewing friends. Um, if you think that they would be interested in this, if they're interested in apparel sewing, um, this is a great, video for them. We're going to be talking about sewing some pajamas today and working with a different substrate than most people are used to working with. So um, make sure you leave a comment. You'll be entered to win. This month we're having um, a special giveaway. So this whole year is our 25th anniversary and um, so we're doing special giveaways each month. If you're part of our newsletter, you've seen those, um, the newsletter emails that come through that tell you about the different prizes for the month. This month, it works out really well that we're partnering with Indigo Junction and Dritz and Omnigrids. And so we're gonna be working with some of their products today. And if you enter to win through the newsletter, um, which I think if you go to the blog, there'll be uh, information on how to enter, then we're giving away five yards of Embrace um, in addition to the giveaways that we're doing every day this week after class. So this is a great month for working with Embrace and learning how to work with it and learning how to use some um, different clothing patterns. So um, I'd also love to hear if you are new to apparel sewing. Um, it's been interesting in my travels and teaching different places. One of the things that I've realized is that um, a lot of times what has happened is that people will start at, full, or at quote, clothes making, at garment making, and then they switch over to quilt making, and then they kind of want to get back into apparel making. Um, and so often it's trying to figure out like what can I make and what's comfortable and what isn't necessarily going to have to be so fitted um, and worrying about being um, really persnickety. So one of the things that I really like about working with the double gauze is that because of the kind of fabric it is, we always choose things that are a little bit looser, easier to fit, and more comfortable. So, um, so we'll talk about that. Um, I think I've got my machine set up. So I think we'll just get into it with the fabric. I'd love to hear your questions too. Okay, so make sure, so I'm here with my partner Hawk. We're still in isolation in LA. And um, he'll read off the comments for us. 
and or questions for for me so that I can answer them for you. So please leave, um, yeah, any comments that you have. All right. So embrace. What is it? Right. It's a double gauze, and so I get a lot of questions about this. Um, but what is it and why is it called double gauze? And a lot of times people think you need to make two layers or use two layers when you're working with it. That's not true. It's actually, it's already two layers. So I'm gonna see if I can show you guys, if I can pick this up, the way that it works. So basically, we call it double gauze because it's actually two layers, okay? So I just split that edge right there is all I did picked it, pulled it apart, and you can see it's two very thin layers of gauze, okay? So this is, um, yeah, I mean, it's really thin gauze. The way that it's put together is that it, when they manufacture it, they do these little lines, and that's what sort of binds it together. I'm sure that there are better manufacturing words for this, but this is how I have it in my head, okay? So these are what binds these two layers together. So you can see I can only split it to those lines, and then I can't split it anymore. It's almost okay? like it's basted. Yeah, almost. Yeah, it's almost like basted together. Um, and so that's the way these are. These lines, you'll notice, are just about an inch, okay? So you can see the little squares on here and the squares on my, whoops, on my, uh, <laughs> on my table here. Um, so these are about the same. So each one of these is about an inch, okay? If I line it up on mm -hmm. here, you can see that if I give it a little tug, it's an inch. So it's not a perfectly accurate way of measuring it, but if something like we do an infinity scarf that's this and you cut um, 18 inches, it's a half yard, I just count down 18 of these and cut it there. Hold okay. on a sec. If mm -hmm. you're, apparently we might have a thing where the microphone isn't actually working the way it's supposed to because it got better when we, I got the, phone, the camera closer. So we're gonna, we're gonna reset the microphone and see what okay. happens. I'm gonna, I'm gonna plug that back in. Okay. Okay, we'll try it again. We'll let me know if it's better. Um, okay, yeah, because we want the sound to be good. And sometimes technology, it's, <laughs> it's a thing. Okay, so embrace double gauze, that's what that is, okay. Um, it is 100% cotton and it is pre-shrunk on the bolt. So when you get it, it's already been shrunk the big amount. So when they make cotton, cotton tends to shrink a lot. And um, so it's pre-washed, it's pre-shrunk. So when you get it, it's already been shrunk for the most part. It will still shrink a little bit when you wash it, but what it does for the most part is it actually crinkles. And so that's where um, I had a piece. Oh, here it is. Um, we, won, we, won the we won the microphone game? Yes! Okay, um, <laughs> this is great. So this is a piece that I did some embroidery on yesterday to um, see how it would work. It worked out beautifully. I really love it. Um, this is just one layer of the gauze with a wash away uh, stabilizer on the back. And I just did one of the delicate ones that were in the machine. So one of just the standard ones. But you can see that this is what happens when it was washed and then just hung dry. So those edges, I didn't iron out those edges. And you can see it frayed up a little bit and it crinkles, okay? So when people say like, oh, but doesn't it shrink a lot? It doesn't really shrink, but it will crinkle, okay? So when we're sewing with it, it's something to keep in mind. Um, for me, the biggest thing is that when I make uh, apparel like dresses or tunics, I've made a lot of dresses that have turned into tunics because they crinkle up more than they crinkle this way. So um, I tend to make things slightly larger than I would need to, just make sure that they're loose fitting so that if it crinkles a little bit, it doesn't have to stretch back out to fit. Um, I like it because the crinkle is, I like this level of crinkle, crinkleness, crinkliness, um, whatever the right word is for that. Um, I like this level, which is hanging it to dry. If you want it to be really crinkly, all you have to do is throw it in the dryer, okay? Throw it in the dryer for longer. The longer it stays in the dryer, the more it crinkles. The other thing to keep in mind is the less print it has, the more it crinkles. So the ones that are, oh, I'm gonna just like keep pulling them out of my embrace drawer here, okay? Um, so let me see, we have a couple, um, here's one. This is one that um, we've had, and this is completely printed except for the white, okay? So all of this blue is a print, and you can see that if I can find the wrong side and flip it over, there we go, okay? So this is the right side, obviously. This is the wrong side, okay? This side is actually a white gauze that's really thin in there. Let's see if I can pull it apart there. 
Okay, so you can see that the back of it is just a white gauze and it's been printed from this side. Okay, so all of this ink will make it so that it doesn't crinkle as much. So what I found is that if I want something that's not going to be so crinkly, I can choose something that's heavily printed. If I want to make something like a blanket or washcloths, because those work really well with this fabric, I will choose a solid because those will crinkle up really nicely. Okay, so just information to keep. I've worked with this stuff a lot for the past couple of years. I love making clothes. It's where I sort of started in sewing was apparel making and so to be able to um, use this fabric to go back to that is really fun okay do we have questions yet about the fabric okay all right I can yammer about this for a long time you guys know that if you've been here before <laughs> you seem like that girl could talk about things um so that that's basically the um the overall of what gauze is you can wash it um I rec we recommend that you wash it in um warm dry it and then take it out before it's completely dry if you don't want a lot of crinkle. If you want it to crinkle, dry it the whole way, it's totally fine. Um, just remember that it will crinkle up more, which makes it seem like it shrunk even though it didn't actually get smaller, okay? So if that happens to you, you've made a dress, and this has happened to me, it's how I know, is that if you make something, you dry it, and all of a sudden it's, <clears throat> excuse me, tunic length instead of dress length, all you have to do is go back to the iron. Iron it, it'll lengthen it out, and you're totally fine I have definitely done that and it's grown like four inches <laughs> in just the ironing it out are we getting me a drink all right thanks <laughs> let's do it <laughs> the talking talking mm. thank you okay so um okay so that's the 100% cotton washing it cutting it out let's talk about cutting it out okay so this is something that you see you'll see in a lot of quilt shops and they have it and they don't know what like they being consumers often don't know what to do with it okay so it's it's something that was originally people thought about using just for baby gear so we have a lot of um I'm trying to see we have some here so like this this cute oh you guys i forgot to show you look i made the cow this week turned out super cute um, <laughs> so if you were here a couple weeks ago for the jelly bean I finished him um, so we have some that are more like baby centric and even just little kid centric okay we used to have some that are like really sweet I have a lot of this stuff you guys um, so there's like this we've had a lot more that was like super sweet we have some that's like little flowers okay lots of stuff originally people were using it for swaddles so it made a lot of sense. We had some very sweet, lovely little prints, very baby prints. And then we realized that people could use it for all sorts of things, um, including um, clothes. So I'll show you here real quick. This is actually one that I put together that's a blanket. And I'm hoping that down the road we'll, we'll, uh, <laughs> that we'll be on stay home orders long enough that I can do a blanket with you guys. Um, this is with Embrace. This has gray on one side, white in the middle print on the other side and this has been washed and dried and you can see the look that it has compared to the look right off the bolt okay um but we have lots of really cute ones but we also started doing some that were more like grown-up prints like that flower i showed you we'll talk about some other ones this is a cross hatch that we have okay this is one of my favorites that i've made a ton of that you can still find it in stores um and colors okay so originally people were thinking that they should just use it for baby stuff and then we realized oh you can use this for clothes um if you uh if you were around in the 70s and you saw Fleetwood Mac at all that's what she was wearing basically for any show um was lots and lots of gauze um it's super comfortable it's flowy it's easy to wear and easy to sew with so when you get it in the stores try to look at it and try to imagine it in different ways other than just a swaddle um, because there's lots of things you can do with it including all of this apparel that we'll talk about okay um, so when you get it at the store we try really hard to educate the stores that they need to stick this back up here that they need to cut it on those grid lines, okay? So when you saw this, these little lines that are on here, this is actually the grain lines, okay? So when it's put together, this is um, the line of the fabric, all right? When they cut it for you at the store, they need to cut it on that line. And we try really hard to make sure all the stores know that, but sometimes it gets missed. So if you're in a store and they're cutting it and they 
pull out the rotary cutter and they're just going to whack it right off at the edge, make sure to be like, hey, could you cut it on the line? Um, and I've done this at stores and it works. Um, because what happens is when it gets folded um, onto the bolt, it gets sort of twisted a little bit and then it starts flipping. If you've ever watched any of the videos that we've shown about how they double and roll fabric, it's pretty fascinating, but it kind of pulls the fabric. And so we wanna make sure, first off, when we start working with the fabric, are we losing our space? Okay. Um, that when we started working with the fabric that we have it cut on the grain. So if we were doing this with quilting cotton, we would snip it and tear it, and that's how we find the grain. With uh, the cotton embrace, what we need to do is cut it on that line. So I'm gonna show you how we do that. So this is just a hunk of fabric that I have. It's one of our um, bestsellers. I love this one personally. It's one of my favorites. I've um, had a few dresses out of this. Okay, so when it's cut, get you the right end here well most mostly i've cut it on the on the line already pretty well but i'm going to do it again for you so when you get it sometimes it'll be a little bit wonky because if they've cut it with a rotary cutter a lot of times what happens is it gets cut off grain and we don't want that so when i get it i'm going to do this mini style okay so if this were on the bolt it would be like this okay and if i cut it i can't see what that bottom line is so what i have them do and this is how I teach stores to do it. So if you're any stores out there watching, this is how I recommend you do it. So you make a little snip, sort of like we do gingham. So if you have been sewing for long enough that you remember cutting gingham, this is how it works, okay? So then I can open it up and I can cut the rest of it. Okay, so we're just gonna cut it all along those lines. What that does is it gives me a grain line to follow. So when I'm cutting out, we'll talk about that a little bit more when I'm cutting out the pattern. Okay, so um, let me tell you what I'm using today because you'll notice these scissors are big and they sound lovely when they cut. Um, these are the Kais, the 7280 SE. Okay, so this is um, their serrated version. Let me see if these are these are the 7250s so these are a smaller version these are not serrated so the se is the serrated and that's what you want to use for the embrace and what happens is it's they're serrated on the bottom so they're serrated on this bottom um, blade okay so this one has the little micro serrations so what happens is that um or i guess they're on the I remember right they're on the top yeah the top is is micro serrated so basically i can slide it under here and it doesn't grab the fabric what i have found but then the top will grab it okay it's a beautiful beautiful sound <laughs> um so what i have found is that if you have serrated on both sides this t side tends to grab the fabric when you slide it under there and then it sort of like snags on it. So what I found is that these scissors are there, my absolute favorite, I use them all the time. I actually have two pair of them. Um, and then I have the smaller ones that are not serrated that I use for cottons. Um, so these are great. These are the Kai ones and I'll be using those a few times today, okay? So the 7250s and the 7280, well, he told me the number, I think this is an 11, 11 inch? Yep, this one's 11 inches, okay? And this guy is nine and a half inches. Um, so this is just a bigger version of it. They're heavier. Um, so if you don't need the, the length of the blade here, this is a really good one. And they have, like I said, they have the 7250 SE, okay? Those are, um, those are great. The other ones that I use um, are those, the little Femore ones are also serrated. So that we use for the, um, the cuddle those are also serrated so anyway so we'll be using those there's your um your uh your little lesson on scissors today but people always ask because i bring these to class and people are like what are those scissors those are huge they are um okay so let me talk about patterns really quick and some of the other tools that we're going to use all right so the pattern that we're doing today is this one it's the indigo junction slumber party pjs all right um her patterns work really well with the gauze fabric. They tend to um, tend to be really well suited for our fabric. So let me show you a couple other patterns. So this is the one that we have That's for the giveaway. Okay, so these are some other ones. I've made some of these. So this is the shift dress and I've made this a couple times in the gauze. Works out great, I really like it. So part of the thing that you're looking for when you're trying to find a pattern that you can work with um, with the gauze is that you want something that doesn't have darts and all that good stuff. Um, 
So if it has some darts, and like the other top here, it does, and that's fine, but we don't want it to be super fitted, okay? And when I do these pockets, I'll often reinforce them. And if you have questions about any of this, you can ask me. But you can see this is just a nice, loose-fitting, easy garment that'll make it easy to work with with the, the gauze. This is just another loose-fitting top, super simple. Okay, that's their easy, easy top and tunic. See, super easy. The crossover tunic is also really good if you look at the pattern. And that's what you really kind of have to do is look at the pattern and see this is just elasticized, so no big deal. Okay, um, you can absolutely put zippers and buttons and darts into all of this, but because it's such an open weave, um, the more fitted it is, the harder it'll be to get it to wear for a long time, okay? But um, you can do any of that with reinforcement. Um, so this is just a little easy uh, tank that they have and this Caitlin's dress top and tunic, and I've made this one out of gauze as well. So most of these I've actually made out of the gauze and it works beautifully. Okay. Do you need to line any of these No. People always want to know that. Like, they think that you have to. I will tell you, you don't. And it's kind of a weird thing. So this is one that I made. Let me see if... Okay, the, powder, the hanger is completely stuck up there. All right, so this is one that I made the other day to show this is the top that we're making, basically. Okay, so if I put my hand under here right next to it, you can see it. But what happens is when you wear it, it actually, as long as you're wearing um, undergarments that match your skin color, you won't be able to see it. Okay, and I have made lots of dresses with this white um, background, basically, and it's been absolutely fine. I haven't had any the biggest thing is don't wear like a black slip under it because you'll see the black under it but if you wear a nude slip you'll be totally fine you don't need to do two layers what we found is if you do do two layers it gets really thick because the gauze likes to kind of puff up when you wash it and so then it ends up being bigger than it, you want it to be. You want it to be light and airy. So I have never had any problems with anything that is um, made with the gauze being see-through at all okay um, Okay, so that, the patterns. Uh, oh, we'll talk about interfacing in a bit. Other things that we are using. So um, so one of the questions that I get with working with gauze is um, that it's kind of squirrely too, okay? So like, <laughs> that's what we do is we do fabric that is, you know, it likes to move. Because the gauze is so lightweight and um, just kind of, loose it tends to not want to stay exactly where you want it to be so one of the things that i recommend that you do is that you use um a spray starch or a spray alternative this is just one of the little best press ones that i have um these work really well i love best press so i use it a lot and you probably have used it in your um in your quilting and that sort of thing as well this works really well because it gives just enough um body for it to work a little bit better oh the other thing is i don't i don't wash it before i cut it out Okay, that's another big one. We talked about this the other day uh, when a group of us um, ambassadors basically were talking about like, do you wash it? Do you not wash it? I don't wash it before I cut it out. I just make it so that it's slightly bigger. And, um, and then I always wash them. Most of the time I'm on the road. So I wash things in hotel sinks and then hang them to dry. Um, but if you want to, you can absolutely wash it, dry it, and cut it out. If you really like the crinkle, that's the way to do it because you will have already put all of the crinkle into it. Um, I would suggest that you work with it with the sizing in it first, learn how it works a little bit, and then you can try the washing it and drying it first. Um, if I do wash it and dry it, I always put starch back into it because I like it being a little bit stiffer when I work with it. Okay, and I'll show you a little bit how that um, changes how the fabric works. But if you're having a lot of trouble with it fraying and with it moving too much, just starch the edges. Okay, that's all you have to do and it makes it really easy. So this gray starch is something that I use sometimes, especially when I'm doing hems, um, we'll do that. You're also gonna want a water soluble marker or a marking pencil. So uh, Dritz makes one that I really like called the Mark Be Gone. Okay, so this one, you've probably seen this one before or have it in your, in your stash. This works really well because it's just water soluble. You spritz it and it's gone. This is just a um, water soluble pencil that I have. I think it's a clover one um, that also works if you're working with dark fabrics, okay? Because the blue ink won't show up on black, for instance, or navy. Um, so I'll use the, the pencil instead, okay? So you'll want to do that. Do that instead of clipping anything. So normally on your pattern, it'll show you like little clip marks. And we don't do that because what happens is when you clip it, you're giving it another place to fray. Okay, so we just mark it instead. 
You're gonna use regular pens, or um, regular pins, uh, a 7010 needle. Okay, so here's the, here's the needles that we use. Okay, so it's a 7010 universal, all right? The reason we do that is because it's a finer fabric and we want it to kind of slide between these, you know, between these threads here. If you use a thicker needle, what happens is it'll puncture those threads and um, cause just a weak point that can actually build into a hole with the, for after a little bit. So we don't want to do that. So a 7010 needle, you're also going to want to have, um, you can have fray check, you can zigzag your edges, you can use the serger. So with this project, we're actually gonna use my serger and we're gonna sort of go back and forth and we were trying to plan our dance earlier and how that's gonna work. Um, so we'll do that a little bit. All right, are you guys ready to start cutting out? Okay, let's do that. Um, okay, so what I've got, I'm gonna move my stuff just off here so I've got board back. I cut my stuff out a couple of different ways. So we can work later. Um, I want to give a special shout out to Sewing Arts who basically overnighted elastic to me. So this is the elastic that we're going to need for our project. It was super great and I was having a really hard time getting elastic, as you may understand. Um, it's funny how all of this has just changed the way that we deal with stuff. Okay, so here's another one. So we just have all sorts of fun things. This is a great one. I like this one a lot because it has so many colors that coordinate with it. Um, the pink and the greens and the blues and all that good stuff. So anyway. Um, yeah, we have a ton of them. So what we're working with today is um, this little fishy one, <laughs> which is super cute. So we're going to do this fish and um, a navy yoke and shorts. Okay, so the way that the pattern is, find the pattern again. Okay. So here's the pattern. So what I did is these two pieces, and I've already cut some of it out so that we could... Um, go a little bit faster. So these two pieces are going to be the solid and then this uh, body part of the top, the bodice basically, is going to be the print and that's going to be our little fish fabric. And then we're going to do the shorts and I did those out of the navy as well. Okay, so the winner for today will get a choice of two different fabrics or one same fabric because you can see that's the way they did these. It's just the same fabric. This one they use the same for the top and the yoke, the bodice and the yoke, and different for the shorts. So you'll get your choice, and um, we'll reach out to the winner and let them kind of pick which ones they want, but that's what we're doing today, okay? So my fish is what I'm gonna cut out for my top. Now one of the things that I like to do when I'm doing garments is I like to trace the pattern. There's lots of different tracing papers that you can use. I by, um, which you might have noticed behind me, I buy um, interfacing by the bolt. So I have a lot of interfacing and that's what I use. So this is just an, a really thin non-woven interfacing. You buy it at the store, I think it usually ends up like just buy the cheapest one and it's like, you know, two or three dollars a yard. Um, and then I trace all my patterns on it. It makes it so that I have pattern sizes still available to me. Um, should I want to make it for someone else or should my weight change? Then I have the ability to make it in a different size. It also gives it um, more wearability so I can use the pattern more times. Okay. So that's what I've done. I've traced my patterns. I marked things out like I want to put this on the fold. I wrote what it was, what piece it was, and what I wanted to do with it, which would be cut it on the fold. Okay. You'll also notice that there's a little mark here. So try to remember to transfer all of your marks. <laughs> transfer all of your marks over when you are um, when you are tracing the pattern. Okay. And then make sure you mark which pattern it is. This is IJPJs, which is for Indigo Junction PJs. Um, one thing I have definitely found is that I have found facings for things that I <laughs> then had no idea what I traced a facing for, okay? So I've traced my pattern. Like I said, I've got these cut out. We'll talk about that later, okay? But let's cut this one out, all right? So when you're cutting fabric out, there's a couple of different ways of doing it. Just depends on what you wanna do, okay? I like to trace this one layer at a time because one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to keep it on the grain. Because the way that the fabric is, it likes to move off grain and when I fold it in half, it doesn't want to stay where it is. A way that you can avoid that is to spray starch it or use like Best Press first, spray it and make it so that it stays nice and straight. I choose to just cut it one layer at a time and that works really well for me. Okay, so what I do 
is I lay it out and what we want to do is make sure that our lines are basically going up and down okay I chose this fabric specifically because it was one that I had enough yardage of and you could see the lines pretty well through my with my blue mat behind it so one of the things that you'll notice is like the blue fabric was harder to cut because um, it was harder to see where the lines were is really what it is is because I couldn't see it on the blue mat so if you have a light table that's a great way to use that is put your fabric over the light table and use that as your um, guide and I know they make a lot of those um, with the cutting mats on them so I've got it laid out Okay, I'm gonna unfold this all the way so I don't accidentally cut anything I didn't want to cut. Lay it so it's basically up and down, okay? And then I'm gonna take it, I'm gonna put this on here so that my fold line is gonna go along one of those lines. So I'm gonna try to save some fabric here. Okay, now this is the line that I want to match it up to. Okay, you can see that it as much as I tried to get it straight across, it isn't straight. So I'm just gonna manipulate it until I can get this on there straight, okay? So this is like, I can like kind of scratch the fabric and make it move. I'll scratch it back this way, get things where I want them to be and lay it out, okay? So one of the other things that I like to do is so for something like this, we know that this is gonna go along the grain line and that the bottom hem is just a straight hem. So that means I can make this one go along one of these lines as well, okay? And then I know it's sort of squared up on there and it will also help me when I'm cutting out that bottom, okay? All right, one of the things about using interfacing for your pattern piece is you can see it sort of sticks to my uh, fabric, which makes it really easy and that I don't actually have to pin it down or anything, okay? Now, you can go ahead and cut this with your scissors or you can cut it with a blade. Okay, so these are all the choices that you have for cutting this out. I like to cut it with a blade depending on how um, intricate. So for sleeves, for like the sleeve cap, I'll often use the little one because I have more um, ability to move a lot. With the 45, it's totally fine. So if you only have a 45, this pattern works okay with it. Um, we've done the bondy top as well and that has a really crook little corner there at the sleeve um, and that one you have to take a little bit more carefully and works really well with a blade this small okay so if you have a, one of these blades you're like i don't never use it for apparel it's really great okay this is what i'm going to use today because it's quick and easy another thing to make sure is that this is going to be lined up on that line do not cut that line okay this is our fold line okay so sometimes i need to make um uh, marks for myself and I've absolutely done that I've done it where I've like done a red line along here that means don't cut that so if you could you want to find a way to remind yourself not to okay so I'm just gonna go along here and cut this out now this line here this goes on this goes on the grain line that's on the fabric so I'm gonna make sure that this is pulled and then that's what I'm cutting on okay and then I'm gonna get up to that line. Now this is my fold line, and I'm just going to now flip this over. So it's basically on the fold, and I'm gonna do the same thing, get it back on that line so that my cuts can continue. So now I need to move this whole thing back. Now if I just pull this, it's gonna to totally torque the how I got it basically on the straight of grain. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna kind of fold this up, and I'm gonna grab all of it and pull it backward so it stays a little bit better I'll move it a bit get it back in place okay I know I want that to go along the grain line I know I want this to go along that line I'm gonna lay it out stick it down again okay did that make sense is everybody following along yes I hope so Usually I just get to tell people what to do with this and not actually do it in front of you. So it's kind of different. Um, so I got that to match here. Now I'm gonna do this thing where you can see I just kind of scratch it with my fingers to get it to move just slightly. All right, this, I can see that this curves under here. I don't care, all right, it's fine. 
if you worry too much about getting it perfect, it will take all the fun out of it, okay? So we worry about certain things. So I try to worry about that hemline and the center fold. The other part, it's gonna be a little bit off and that's okay because I, honestly, this is the way I've tackled it the entire three years I've been making clothes with this and um, I have yet to make anything that didn't lay right because it was cut off grain or that anybody was like, ooh, that, ooh. No, that's yet to happen. Okay, so the other thing that I'm gonna do while I'm here is I'm gonna mark this little dot. So remember I was telling you about marking it? So I'm just gonna take this and I'm gonna mark it with my little blue marker. And I'm gonna come back and do the same thing over here. Okay, I will tell you that in the pattern, she tells you how far that is away from the bottom, which was awesome because the first time I forgot to transfer that mark. Okay, the other thing, whoops, the other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come up here and I'm gonna mark the, um, the line basically that was my half, okay? So this was my fold line right here because that's gonna be my center line when I go to put it together and I'm gonna want that, all right? So make sure you mark that, all right. So now I've got that one. So I'm gonna fold it up with the pattern piece, put it to the side. What did I do? There they are. I'm like, what did I do with my stuff? Okay, now let's hope I measured this out right. We have enough here. Otherwise, I'll be cutting off more yardage. Oh, good. Look at that. I did it. Yay. Okay, so this is going to be the exact same way. I'm actually going to use this bottom line that already got cut because I know that it's on the straight. Okay, and I'm going to find another one to bump it up to for my center line. Move the fabric around just a little bit. Get it to work right. And then I'm going to cut it out. Okay, so I'm gonna show you how it is with the scissors. With the scissors are fine. What I have found is that they can just, they move the fabric more. Okay. Okay, so I'm just gonna cut right along there. Up to, the par up to that fold, so this is my fold line right there. Okay, this little line right here. So then I'm gonna take this, flip the pattern over. I'm not gonna cut along that center line. Okay, and I'm gonna pretend it's a fold. If you decide that you wanna just fold it in half, you can, but you need to be real careful to make sure that those lines actually follow each other. And I find it easier um, if I just do it flat. So I used to try to be lazier and, um, and do them double over, and then I found that I, sometimes I would have to correct things that I didn't really want to. Okay, I'm gonna show you this little guy. Okay, so this one, it has a little thing on the back where you can do it for um, light or heavy, or I can't remember what the words are down there, but basically like this is if you have just one layer or a couple layers, and if you're cutting more, you can flip it over to the other side. Okay. Oh, looks like I need to change that blade. Okay, so one of the things about the little one is that you can really do like some pretty tight little curves um, and it will work, okay? So that's the nice thing about the little blade where it's a little bit harder to do with the scissors to get those nice curves, so a little blade is great for that, okay? On the Bondi top that I was talking about, there's one that's like, like this it's like a really tight little corner and this works really well for it okay all right so now we have a bunch of scrap over here that I can use for another project we have a really great um <laughs> I say that and then I kind of laugh at myself we have we have a tutorial that I did so it may not be that great but I think it's a pretty good one on how to do the embrace infinity scarf which is a really easy one to do. Um, and you can totally do that with your, with your scraps. Um, the other thing I like to do, I mentioned it earlier, is to make washcloths. Um, so I will do a couple of layers, usually three or four layers of the gauze, and then just serge them together and make a little washcloth. I was gonna show you guys one, but they're washcloths I use, so. Um, <laughs> all right, so I've got both of those pieces cut out, okay? And um, so I've got these, and I've got my shorts pieces, and I've got my yoke pieces. These are the shorts. Okay, so for this, 
one of the things that um, I have found is that I don't particularly love the um, gauze for facings. All right, so this requires a facing, which you can do it with a bias facing, and um, or you can do it as the pattern says with um, just a regular facing that's interfaced. Um, so the way that this is done is with the gauze, and I uh, a I think this is a woven. Yeah, so I fused the the woven interfacing onto the back of it, surged it, and then sewed it. And this has been washed, and that's why it's a little um, a little wonky right now because I haven't pressed it since I washed it because I wanted you guys to see how it worked. So what I have found is that the gauze is a little bit thicker after it's washed than I prefer. So I actually use, for most of mine, I use a cotton lawn. Um, so you can absolutely use the gauze, 100% it works. There is nothing wrong with using it. Um, I just wanted to show you the way that I figured out that I like to, I like to do it. So I do it with a cotton lawn. This is one that I have from uh, Robert Kaufman. It's their Cambridge cotton. And um, I like it a lot. I have fused it with SF-101 from Pellon, which is a woven interfacing, a fusible, um, that I like a lot because it has the same body basically as cotton. So I found that this stays a little bit thinner, lays flatter, and I like it a lot. If you've been to any of my classes before where we've done the tops, we always do them out with cotton lawn. Um, but I wanted to show you a couple of other interfacings that you can use if that's what you have on hand. Okay, so here's my pattern pieces. I'll put those there. So this is the SF-101. Okay, you can see on this side, it's just basically like a very, very thin cotton. Nice big piece of fuzz there. Okay, this is just like a woven cotton, very, very thin. And then on this side is actually the fusible. Okay, so when you're ironing it, make sure that you put your fusible down. Okay, so this works really well for collars and facings and that sort of thing. It works really well with uh, woven fabrics. This one is actually a knit interfacing. If you haven't seen those, they're great because they have stretch to them. So you can use this on knit fabrics. I like it to use it sometimes on the gauze because some things in the gauze, I want it to have some flexibility. So for me, this is what I'll use on pockets with the gauze because it kind of keeps the soft feeling of the gauze a little bit more. Okay, this is, and these are all from Pellon. The SF-101 is the only one I know the, the number for, but this is just their knit interfacing. <clears throat> and this one is a, um, a lightweight, non-woven, fusible interfacing. Okay, so this is a really nice lightweight one. That's what you want to use is always a lightweight. And I like the fusible, but you can absolutely use um, uh, the non-fusible as well. And especially if it's going to be somewhere that you're going to see it on the outside, because you'll notice that it kind of puckers a little bit with the uh, with the fusible because it'll come off in certain places. So if you're doing that on the inside, it's no big deal. If it's someplace that's going to show on the outside, um, like for zippers or for buttonholes, I'll use a non-fusible. Okay. That was a lot of information. Sorry, guys. I have a lot in my head. Okay. <laughs> so, um, all right. So now we've got, I've got the cotton lawn. I've got the uh, fusible interfacing on here. Okay, and now I'm just gonna cut these guys out. Okay, and I've got my little pattern pieces traced. And I'm gonna throw a couple of pins on these to keep them in check. All right, so this is my facing for the top. Okay, the other place that you could use a um, the interfacing, which I didn't on the shorts that I made and they worked out okay, but if you're struggling with that, <clears throat> excuse me, that waistband a little bit is on the shorts. Is that you can use it on the waistband to give that, um, give it a little bit more strength. So one of the things that I found with working with the gauze is that if you have a place that needs a little bit more stability and strength, the interfacings are really good for that. All right, so we're just gonna cut this out. So I was always a pinner and scissor cutter outer. <laughs> and um, until I started working at a shop in Portland called Modern Domestic and they taught me how to cut it out with a rotary cutter. And I was, I really bulked at it at first. And then now it's really, it's my go-to method. It's so much faster than scissors. Um, and you can absolutely use um, pattern weights as well for this, just to hold these down. I like to use pins for little pieces because if they shift, it really messes you up. 
but pattern weights work just as well. All right, we'll take my pins out. I'm gonna keep those patterns with the piece. And then we can start construction. Do we have any questions? Are people wondering? Okay, all right, good, good. Um, and thanks for joining us. I appreciate you being here. Um, okay, so this is my front and this is my back. All right, so for the way that I like to do anything that I'm working with the embrace is I like to basically tackle the neckline first. Because we've cut the neckline on a scoop and I cut these out and then I haven't, I haven't touched them since. But you'll notice that when you start working with it, it starts loosening up those fibers and it'll start to fray a little bit more. So when I'm doing any garments at all with the gauze, I do the neckline basically first. So we're gonna do the shoulder seams and the neckline, and that's what we're gonna do today, and then we'll come back tomorrow and we'll make the rest of the shirt, okay? Um, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to sew the um, shoulder seams together. I just realized I just have white thread. So we're gonna do it with white thread. Um, when you're doing this, you can absolutely sew with, um, you can do this all with your serger. If you have, um, you have a four thread serger, you can absolutely do it, do it all with your serger. I like to go back and forth. So I tend to sew and then I serge and then I sew and I serge. And we'll do a little bit of that today. Okay. So, um, yeah, so Hawk can put the, do the camera thing. Come on around here. We'll get this set up. I'll move the, uh, <laughs> the pile O embrace. <laughs> we might have a little bit. <laughs> okay, so the way that I've got my machine set up is I've got it, um, I'm going to shrink my stitch down to a 2.0. 2 so basically, like I said, everything that we knew with Cuddle, we're going to shift it with Embrace. So we make the stitch smaller, and I'm going to use the 7010 Universal Needle, okay? Um, if you are having any trouble with it puckering, at all or gathering up on you, shrink your shrink your stitch. The other thing, I haven't had any trouble with this is, um, but sometimes people will have it like basically eat, the, the machine will wanna eat it um, because it's so lightweight. So if that's a problem, make sure that you switch to a single needle plate, okay? So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sew. No walking foot. There's no walking foot. Exactly, so no, no walking foot on this one. You absolutely could use it if you want to, but you do not need to. Um, so our embrace, the solid embrace, is the same on either side, the way that it's dyed, and so it's not printed blue, it's actually dyed blue, so no matter which side you use, it's totally fine. So we're gonna stick these right sides together. Okay, you can pin this a little bit if you want to. What I have found is that pins tend to fall out. So I have a different way of pinning it. Surprise! Um, <laughs> in that I, tend to pin it just a couple of places, but I'll pin in, out, in, out, okay? That makes it less likely I can flick it a lot and it's not gonna fall out. If I just have it through one time and I flick it a bunch, it'll totally fall out, okay? So it's just like a weird little way of doing it that works well to keep those pins in there. So I'm just gonna pin at the start and stop of each so I know where to start. Um, I'm going to say this was a 5 8 inch seam allowance, and I might have to be corrected, but I'm pretty sure it is. Make sure you check your seam allowances. Usually it's 5 8 sometimes every once in a while it's half. There are some pattern companies who change it depending on the seam. So always make sure and check that out because it will make a difference. Okay, okay so I'm going to do the same thing here. And then I'll start it. And that way it just starts and ends in the right place. And I can kind of manipulate it as I go. What I found is that the pins, because they like to come out, they become more of a pain <coughs> to me than um, having to manipulate it as I sew. Okay. All right. So I've got it in my machine. I've got a straight stitch. I've got my just regular old foot on there. Here's my 5 8 mark which is gonna be this first little line here. So I'm gonna go ahead and just line that up there, put it all the way underneath the foot, and then I'm gonna sew forward and backward. Okay. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna keep an eye on this as it comes through, that I want it to be heading straight. You're gonna notice that it kind of wiggles and it moves and it does things, and that's okay. Um, what I do is I just kind of keep, um, some tension on it. I don't know if you guys can see that where it kind of flattens just a little bit if I 
pull on it um, and that's what I'm trying to do is just keep it so that it's nice and flat as it comes through and I'm just going to sew it nice and slow okay and truthfully if I were making this for something that I wanted to keep and wear a lot I would change this thread out to a navy but I'm not going to because one you can see it better and two this is just a sample for here and plus I'll probably just sleep in it oh wait I made it a size for my my daughter never mind this won't fit me <laughs> okay my daughter will just sleep in it okay so we're just gonna come right along here you'll see it wants to do these funny things and I just sort of shove it back to where I want it to be Make sure that it's heading straight into the machine. If these sides don't match, it's okay. Don't even worry about it. Okay, okay and I'll take my thread out. All right, so now I've got these done. So at this point, we have two options. We can leave this be, well, I guess we have three options actually. We can leave it be. You could put some fray check on this too so that it doesn't fray too much more. You could zigzag this edge or you can surge it, okay? And um, let's zigzag it this time. We'll do the serger for the, uh, the other thing, just so you guys can see how it works. So basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come over here. I want still a nice wide one, but I don't want it to be as, um, as long as I normally would for cuddle. So I have it, I have it saved in there for, um, for cuddle, <laughs> so it's 5'5", five five, but we don't want it to be like that. We want it to be a little bit smaller. So I want it to be wide, but not as, um, not as long. Okay, so this is just gonna catch that edge so it's not gonna fray as much. What we found is that you can, if you um, stitch a layer, it'll fray, but it won't fray past that. Um, so it's not gonna just like fall apart, but you do wanna sort of catch the edge so that it doesn't fray too much, okay? So that's how the, uh, the zigzag looks. All right, we'll do that to the other shoulder seam as well. Okay, and it, you have, um, you probably have like a fake overlock stitch on yours, I know mine does, um, and you could absolutely do that. I'm not one, like there are certain garments that I will do fancy finishes on the inside, but most of the time I'm like, it just needs to be finished enough. Okay, this little knot o mess right here is because I am not using a leader ender or holding my, my thread when I start, just so you know. So you guys have that, that's what that is. You can avoid that little mess by holding your threads when you start. Like, you know, we were all taught to do. <laughs> okay, so now I've got my top, okay? So here's my yoke, and now I can, I can attack the neckline. Because you can see, even as we start going, just this little bit, it's already starting to fray here. So what I have found is that if this really starts to bother you a lot, what you can do is just spray starch this when you first start sewing. So if it's, if it's difficult to sew with at all, just spray starch it, sew the whole thing, throw it in the wash, it softens all up, the starch all goes away. Um, but it will give you some more stability. Um, I've learned not to worry about the fraying and all that too much, but what I do is I tackle this first so it can't get any further really on me, okay? So this is my back neckline because it's shorter. My front neckline is a little bit longer. I'm gonna put these two pieces together, right sides together. Like figure out which one is my right side because that woven interfacing makes it a little easy to get uh, confused by it. Okay, so I'm gonna hold these together and then I'm gonna go sew them. I don't even need to pin them. They're not gonna go anywhere. Okay, I say that, it's totally gonna fall apart on me. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna get this in here, do the same thing. Oops, I'm gonna switch it back to a straight. Okay, I'm gonna stitch backward. Oh no, oh no, my bobbin is almost empty. Can you believe it? Okay, let's switch that baby out so it doesn't ruin halfway through, because that'll be sad. So we're just gonna stick a gray in there because that's what I've got. At least I have some pre-wound bobbins, oof. Bobbin chicken is, is, a, is a real game. Have I talked to you about that one yet, Hawk? <laughs> that's what happened with my embroidery. If anybody is uh, familiar with that embroidery design, they're like, but wait, that's not the whole thing? Yeah, it's not. It's because I played Bob and Chicken and lost. So I didn't get the whole embroidery on there. Yep. 
That's true. <laughs> it's really hard to keep the camera steady when I'm giggling. Just so you know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so I'm just going to leave that in here, bring this back up here. Put the, whoops, put these two together and keep on stitching. Okay. I'm just gonna sew right over onto that one. I can just clip those apart when I'm done. Okay, I'll clip that thread, take it out, and now I can just clip it in between those. Okay, so now I've got these. So at this point, this can be um, cut smaller or just pressed apart. I'm going to um, just finger press them apart so that they'll lay slightly flatter. Okay, and then we'll put that on. All right. So when I hold it like this, I can see as well, this is my lower scoop, so this is my front, this is my higher scoop, so this is my back, okay? This is my right side, so I need to put my right side in here, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lay this down, okay? This was my back, this was my front. If I remember right, this was my back, this was my front. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna mark this real quick so I have my centers. Okay. All right, so now I've got my centers marked and I'm gonna do the same thing here real quick, okay? just so that I know that I'm matching those. When you're doing things that are um, a larger neckline, it's, it's much more important. This one I could probably fudge it and be okay, but I don't wanna show you the, <laughs> the fudging techniques. I wanna show you the real ones. Um, but especially on a larger, t larger shirt or a larger neckline, I mean, it will make a big difference, okay? So. There we go. All right, so now I've got my centers marked. And then I'm gonna take these. This was my back. Make sure I'm putting the right ones together. So this is my back. So here's my center and my center. I'm gonna try to get those two together. Okay, so there they, there they are. Can you see that? Those are the two lines. Okay, so I'm gonna put those two together. I'm gonna pin them. Okay. And then I'm gonna put my right sides together here with my seams, okay. Okay, I'm gonna just put those, pin those together. Um, most people pin with the shoulder seam going back. If you're familiar at all with Palmer Pletch, they suggest putting them forward and it because it hides your seam better. So there's a little insight for you. So depending on what I'm doing, I change that. Okay, so there's my center mark. Here's the little white mark that I made. And there's my little blue mark. And I'm just gonna line those up. Okay, so basically I'm gonna do the four corners uh, first, and then I'll pin in between. Okay. So this one I pinned forward, the other one I pinned backward. Or I tried to, I stab it back there. Um, so it stays, and we'll look and see what the difference is between the shoulder seams, okay? Um, just so you can see the different ways of doing it. So now once I've got this pinned, I'm just gonna add a few more pins in between. And you can see that what happens with the gauze is it will start to grow. So this is barely done it, but what happens is when, um, when it's sat out for a while and it's had any weight and it gets warm, it tends to open up a little bit, which makes it a great fabric for wearing, um, but not so much when you're trying to sew with it uh, super accurately. So I tend to, um, it tends to stretch a little bit, so I just kind of feed it into place, into the right places, and then sew it back where it belongs. I was gonna tell you too, when you're doing the, um, the, uh, the facing here, when you're doing it out of gauze, then you can um, iron the inner facing onto the gauze first and then cut it out. 
Okay, so that's the way I do. Don't cut out your interfacing and your gauze separately because the gauze will grow. And trying to get it to fit back again is really frustrating. So um, just iron the two of those together, then cut out your facings. All right. Okay, so you can see there's some little bits in here where it's a little bit bigger, the gauze is. And it's just, it's one of the, just the nature of gauze. And so you're just going to deal with it. Give it a little tug. Get it to stretch in there. Um, you'll be fine. Okay, what we will do to combat that as we sew is that we'll always keep gauze sides down. Okay, and that way it lets your feed dogs work it through as you're going. All right, a few more pins. Okay, I'm just going to try to keep those edges even. And it's, it's always interesting to me how much it likes to shift and shimmy on me, but I can get it to come back. Like I said, what you'll, you'll sew it with the, with the down against the feed dogs. It makes all the difference. Okay. If you sew it with the gauze side up, you're going to struggle with it a little bit more. All right. I, so I also noticed with the interfacing in there, you're only doing the single pin as opposed to the double pin. Right. That you, yes. That yeah. So in here, I only pin it. Yeah. Through one time, um, because it will stay because of the cotton, but with the double gauze, double on double gauze, it tends to move. So I will do the like in and out. It's not double pinning and I I'm trying here. To reconnect. Oh, and we're back. Okay. Right. Good. All right, sorry guys, looks like we disappeared for half a second. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm actually just putting this, so pull, pull back so I can see the whole thing. So instead of taking off my arm and just having the free arm here, I just lay it out flat. That's, um, mostly it's a matter of habit and I don't like to take off the free arm unless I have to, have to. Um, part of it is because I learned, or I've spent most of my adult life sewing on a machine that's in a table. And so um, I'm just really used to sewing it flat. You can absolutely take your free arm off and sew it along there. Okay, I wanna make sure that I'm on the right stitch and all that good stuff, yep. Okay, so we're gonna sew this down and then we're gonna go to the searcher. Okay, so you can, like I said, you can absolutely do all of this sewing on your serger if you want. I prefer to do the back and forth method, um, but I have definitely constructed entire garments on there. Okay, so we're just gonna spin around here, take it nice and slow around the corner and just fidget things so that I can be in the right place. Okay, when you're doing your um, your seams, make sure that this, the guide that you're looking at is next to your needle. It gets a little bit harder when we have this curve, and what people wanna do is to sort of look over here and try to get this over into that onto that line, because that's where it's supposed to be. But what we wanna do is let it feed through and just make sure that it's at that guide as it comes through by the needle. Okay, so don't worry about moving it too much before you get there especially when you're sewing it flat like this, because what you'll do is you'll distort it way more than you need to. Okay. I'm just gonna sew all the way around here. So the only, uh, the downfall of this is I can't throw my pins to the side because I'm just gonna hit it with the collar or the facing. We, was there a question? Hmm. Okay. There was a comment about how nice and quiet here. Oh, it really is. Yeah, it's it's a really nice machine. Yeah, it's a baby lock crescendo. We'll be doing the um, serger that I have is also a baby lock. It's um, uh, I can't remember Triumph. I think is the name of it. Yeah, we were talking today. I, yeah. I don't know, can you hit the like button if you have a serger? Hit the love button, do something. I'd love to see how many people have sergers because honestly, it makes this project, any project with the gauze, like super duper easy. Um, if there are lots of people with sergers that we want to um, do more, let me know because there's lots of different techniques that we can do, including rolled hems and fraying on purpose and all sorts of things. Oh, we've got lots of it. Okay, so now I've got it done. So now, oh shoot, I didn't get my iron ready. I got to do that. Um, I got to plug in my iron. All right. So now what I can do oops, is I'm going to, uh, we're going to go over first. We're going to go over and we're going to surge this whole thing. We're going to surge this edge and this edge at the same time, mostly because I like to um, sort of batch what I'm doing. So I could have sewn these together, surged this whole edge and then sewn this on. 
but I sewed it together, sewed this, and then I'll do both sergings, okay? I hope that sort of made sense, but this edge will need to be finished, and we can do that with the serger as well, okay? So, all right, so we're going to do a little magical moving around. Okay, we're going to go this way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. We did. Like, we're sort of tethered together with the uh, with the uh, microphone. Okay, so okay, so we'll see if we can we can get this figured out so you guys can see <laughs> and um, and hear me still. Okay. All right. Now you get to see a little more of my studio. Um, all right. So um, I have all of my stuff when I'm first standing up because that's the way I like to sew. But you are. Yeah, welcome to the sitting down too. All right, so I'm just gonna take a little bit off this edge and I'm just gonna surge all the way around. But what I wanna do is make sure that this is flat and not caught underneath, okay? Because it's way more frustrating when you get this caught under there and end up trimming it off. One of the... Um, one of the first things I ever tried to surge, I ended up doing that and cut a huge hole in the skirt. Yeah, it was not exciting. So the reason we're doing this basically is just to keep it from getting um, super frayed and sort of flattening that seam, okay? Because with this seam, we've got um, the layer of the embrace, we've got a layer of the cotton lawn and the interfacing, okay? I'm just trying to make sure that this is all flat as I go. So by surging it, we'll keep it from fraying, but we'll also keep it all nice and flat, okay? So I'm sewing in, a, in like basically that same circle, um, and most of my fabric is over here, and I'm trying to keep it out of the way from underneath. So I, you'll notice I keep my hand on here and keep a feel for it, because I really, really don't want to catch it under there, either to sew it on or to cut it. It's, yeah, neither one of those are fun outcomes, and uh, if you've done much surging at all you know it happens. So um, just keep a hand on it. Make sure that you're only getting what you want to get. Okay, so I'm going to come all the way around here, meet up where I was. Okay, cut that tail. Okay, so now I've just surged this. It's just going to live like that. It's totally fine. It's not perfect. And it's all right. This one I'm going to take and we're going to go all the way around this edge just to neaten it up because this is what's going to be, you're going to see this under the garment. Okay, so this is, okay, so this is, um, this will be shown. Yeah, there we go. So I want this one to be a little bit neater, make sure it looks nice. So I'm going to care that it's even, whereas the other one I didn't care as much. Okay. Just going to take it nice and slow as it goes through the, as it comes through. All right, and it basically neatens up those edges too where your, where your seam comes together. And it's just going to trim that off and give it a nice little edge. I just want to make sure that all of these things get tucked out of the way. Okay, and at this point you can see it doesn't want to it doesn't want to turn quite as well. So all I'm going to do is I'm just going to lift my foot and let it come over a little. Okay, so don't be afraid to lift your foot and turn, especially when you're doing tight corners. It'll really help a lot to to make it come through smoothly. Okay, so don't try to fight your fabric as much as learning to use your machine to to manipulate it. Okay, we're going to come right back over where I was. Okay. All right, so now I have this little tail. So what I like to do with these little tails when I have them is I'm going to pull this up here and tuck it in. Okay, and then I can actually just stitch it down. So I'm going to do that so it will stay out of the way. You can totally knot these, cut them off. You can slip them in here. There's all sorts of techniques. This is just the one I do. Um, all right, so now we're going to go back over the sewing machine. Okay, ready? Great, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> right, hang on. I want to. I want to change the light back. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay well, we're, we're Here, I'll hold the phone. There we go. Okay, good. All, All right. right. <laughs> thanks for thanks for coming along with us, guys. Okay, so I'm just gonna stitch this down real quick. Sorry right, if you're getting seasick. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Okay. All right. So now what I'm going to do 
is um so this is when I would have my iron but I didn't heat my iron you guys um I have a little a little presser tool I'm trying to look over there do you have the little roller that I have do you know what I'm talking about I think it, would you go I'll hold this would you go look in the red cups over there Okay, so what I want to do is find my little, um, it's like a little wallpaper roller. Um, it's made from Violet Craft, and it's like this little thing that you use a lot for paper piecing. Oh, there we go. We got it. Okay, I'll show you guys how this works. Okay, so this, I originally got it for paper piecing because that's what Violet does a lot of, so Violet Craft tool. Um, but basically, you can use it as a finger press sort of tool. And so what I'm doing is I am pressing the seam toward the facing. Okay, so normally you would use your iron for this, but this is a nice, um, it's a quick and easy way of doing it too. Especially if you're just doing a little bit and you don't want to have to set up your whole, your whole system. If you've got, you know, you're going to be ironing just a tiny bit and you have to pull out the ironing board and everything, that's a pain in the rear. So this works in situations like that. Okay. <laughs> As Ellen like, wait, she didn't tell me about that tool. <laughs> Sorry, Ellen. I try to let her know all the tools I'm going to talk about, but sometimes things come up. Okay. I have my little Aliso iron over here, but I didn't, uh, I didn't plug it in and get it heated up. So um, we don't want to wait for that. All right. So you can see that that presses it over pretty darn well. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little bit of understitching and understitching is what will hold this to the back when it comes in so that your facing stays inside. What happens a lot of times is when you do this and then you want to fold this over and top stitch, you'll end up having the white come back over and it'll pop up or it'll do that thing where it sort of like humps up in the middle and creates like a little, a little humpa dump in there. Burp, burp. And we don't want that. So pressing it over to the one side and then under stitching it will make it so that this stays nice and flat and folds over beautifully. Okay, so I'm gonna look, I don't know. I don't think I actually have. So um, if you've joined me before, you've seen my stitch in the ditch that I use for the walking foot. Okay, so I don't have one of those for the regular, the regular foot which is fine. But this one, if you use this and then you knock it over a couple stitches, it's beautiful top stitching, which also works for the under stitching here. Okay. So this one, I'm just going to eyeball it. And what I need to do is make sure that that's folded over. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use the side of my foot here. Okay. And then I can look and I can see where my needle's going to come down. And I'm gonna see if I can take it over. Let's see. Is it, is it moving? It's not moving, I don't know why. Okay. Now I'm gonna see if I can do it. No. Well, I don't know why my needle doesn't wanna move, but okay, we're just gonna leave it there for now. But what you can do is, you know, when your machine wants to once to <laughs> move the needle over, you go right ahead. This will work fine though. Okay, and I'm just gonna run it right along the side. Okay, and I'm just gonna keep making sure that this gets pulled over so that my facing, that's where the seam allowance is, okay? So that's what I'm, I'm feeling for. So if I can't feel that in there, I know that something's gone sideways on me and I need to get it back into the right place. If I'm feeling it over here, I'm gonna catch that before it gets under the needle, okay? And that's important as we try to catch these, these little goofs before we get to, before it gets to the needle. Really wants to focus on your fingers. Sorry. <laughs> probably because I'm moving them so much. So I'm just manipulating the fabric. So you can see there's a big hump here. If you keep sewing this way, it's gonna come down and get a little pucker here. So I'm just gonna kind of push it back this way as I'm sewing around. To get that hump to work. Now I can feel that the seam went over to the wrong side again. So I'm just gonna push it over. You can absolutely pin this in a few places. Okay, I found that I can usually manipulate it with my fingers enough that it works, but if you're, if you're struggling with it, absolutely feel free to pin it. 
okay? And it's funny because in the classes when we do the tops, this is one of those steps that a lot of people um, don't realize that they can slash should do, and it really makes a huge difference in how your facings lay. So if you haven't done it before, and you've been trying to sew apparel and frustrated with how your necklines are, give this little technique a shot, and uh, you might be kind of amazed at how much how much nicer it lays. So if I had that little foot on here, it would just be running along that edge and be a perfect uh, edge stitch here. But uh, yeah, this is close enough, whatever. It'll be fine. So I'm gonna do the same thing here, manipulate it, make it come underneath the foot, and then keep, keep pulling this so that it lays flat as it comes underneath the machine, okay? Because that's what I want to make sure that it's not getting bunched up and puckering and in places, okay? So I'm gonna come back around here. I'm gonna meet up with my stitch, back stitch a couple times, and then take it out. All right. So at this point, we've got our neckline. It's just gonna wanna sort of turn in on itself, okay? So you can see that it makes it turn in really nicely, all right? So now I'm gonna, um, I will go turn on my iron and I'll press it. But first what we're gonna do is I'm gonna finish up this neckline and then we'll come back tomorrow and we'll do the rest of it. But what I wanna do is with this facing, okay? So this facing needs to lay flat on this side and it needs to stay in place. So I do this sort of weird thing that I'm sure I'm not the only person who does is that I'm gonna pin this in place and I'm gonna tack it to the seam allowance, okay? In some patterns you'll see They'll have you push this over, make it match, okay? And then what you're gonna do is you're going to just stitch in the, um, in the ditch here, okay? And you could stitch along this whole thing and it will stay. You could absolutely do that. Because I'm using white thread today on blue fabric, it would look terrible. Um, and you would just see it. But usually you can absolutely hide it in there. Um, but what I tend to do is I just sew them to the seam allowance. So I'm just making sure that this is turned in a little bit. You can see it's less than an eighth of an inch of the blue that I can see, maybe a sixteenth of an inch. Okay, I'm gonna get this to match so that my seam lines match, just like I sewed it. And then I'm gonna pinch it real hard, flip it, and then I'm gonna pin it there, okay? Okay, so now I've pinned these two together. So basically, this is gonna stay in place like this. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sew these together, all right? Okay, so let's go over to the machine real quick. I will do that. Basically, we're just tacking these together so that it stays in place better. You could also top stitch um, if you wanted to. Okay. I'll show you what I mean. Okay, so it's just a little, just a little tack down. Just holds it in place right there. That looks terrible because it's gray and white and oh, so messy. But on this side, it doesn't show at all, and it holds the facing in place. Okay, so now my facing isn't going to flip out all the way around, um, and it will stay in place much better once I have um, actually pressed it. Okay. So I'm gonna come over here, I'm gonna do the same thing, and I'm just catching the seam allowance of the blue and the facing, all right? So sometimes I'll do it just with like a little zigzag along that edge. You can do whatever you want. It's just a little tack down stitch, okay? So not super duper important, but helpful, okay? So this is the same thing. So we're gonna take this, I'll take this to the iron. We're gonna prep this for tomorrow. This will be all pressed down. Nice, you can see how it wants to lay. Okay, let me pull that just back a little bit. All right, so you can see this is how the facing is gonna lay. Very nice now, it's a great finish. If you want to, you could do a top stitch along here to hold this all really well. But what I found is it doesn't actually need it. It will stay down well enough. Trim up some of my threads here. Okay, so there you go, there's our top. There we go, ta-da, you're done. No, just kidding. Uh, we have a ways to go. Um, so tomorrow we'll be back, we'll do the t-shirt, um, the rest of the t-shirt tomorrow. We'll do the sleeves and um, the body and all of that good stuff, okay? So we'll get all of that taken care of tomorrow and then we're gonna do the shorts. And um, so if you have enjoyed this, please share it, please tag your friends. Um, you can also join us on our Facebook page when you're here, but you can also like, 
follow us and then you'll get notices of when we do the live videos you can follow us on i love cuddle that's our um, consumer group where we all get to share our different projects and all of that good stuff um, i sort of head that one up and um, it's a great way to get in contact with us so um otherwise what did i oh did we have a winner i forgot what else do i need to do um so make sure that you go to our i think if i remember right go to our um blog which is like blog.shannonfabrics.com or shannonfabrics.com slash blog ellen will post the link to it um go to the blog and then you can um register for our newsletter and then you can also enter to win that five yards of embrace okay so today we're doing um We'll do two combos of the embrace so that you can make your own, as well as Indigo Junction is gonna send you the pattern, okay? So our winner for today is Jane Malone from Picayune, Mississippi. I think that might be how you pronounce it. Who knows? Um, you'll know. Um, so Jane Malone from Mississippi, thank you so much. You're the winner for today. So one of us will be getting a hold of you, we'll get your mailing address, and we will send you some fabric to work with so you can make your own set of PJs, all right? Thank you so much for joining us. Follow along. And uh, yeah, until, until tomorrow, happy sewing. Bye.